Hello, my name is Billy Zhang. I'm the formal technical director at Penn State Milton Hershey's Vascular Lab. I presently am the clinical marketing manager at GE Healthcare, and today I'd like to talk to you about renal duplex imaging. Okay, let's start with the lecture. Uh, the first thing that's very important about this renal duplex ultrasound um, exam that we're going to be performing today is the equipment that you're going to be using. You really need to have a high-end system to uh, attempt to do any abdominal work, um, especially if you're looking at the vasculature. Um, the transducers that you're going to be using are going to be the lower frequencies because of the um, depth of the vessels that you're trying to be interrogating. Um, so frequencies between 2 and 5 megahertz are often used. Uh, and you will also have to use uh, color mode, power mode, and any other advanced imaging applications to help identify some of these really tough structures that you will be looking at uh, when you're in the abdomen looking at the arteries. The transducers that you're going to be looking at, since they're the lower frequency transducers, many of you are familiar with the curved linear um, as having those type of low frequencies as well as the phased array transducers that we see right here. Um, quite typically, I will start with a curved linear transducer, and then if I have a very difficult patient, I'll move to my sector. The sector can also help me out because it allows a little better window getting through the ribs um, if I have the patient in a lateral decubitus position looking at that renal artery or the parenchyma um, or at the uh, renal artery as it moves back towards its origin at the aorta. Um, that sector scan helps me get through those ribs when that patient is in that lateral decubitus position. But as I just said, the curved linear transducer will probably be your go-to transducer. And a lot of major manufacturers have curved linear transducers in several different frequencies. And depending on your patient's body habitus, you may find yourself uh, in a situation where you do not have to use a lower frequency. And in fact, a higher frequency transducer will give you better image quality and allow for better color sensitivity. Um, so based on your patient, please choose your transducers appropriately. That also being said, you may be in a unique situation where a linear transducer may also serve that purpose. And this really comes into play if you are doing a renal transplant uh, when you are scanning for renal artery stenosis or functionality within that transplant itself. Patient preparation is really one of the most important aspects of this exam, if you can believe it or not. Uh, the patient should come into your office NPO or in the hospital setting be NPO after midnight. Diabetics will be a concern and we usually allow them to have a light breakfast. No smoking or chewing um, is what we recommend because that will um, allow air into the stomach area and obviously you're going to be hunting around in those areas for the artery. We want the patients to take their morning medicine, obviously. Most of these patients are sick and have other problems going on and certainly for a renal examination you're going to have patients that have hypertension and there are certainly most likely going to be on some antihypertensive medicine. And then renal imaging should be done in the AM also to avoid uh, any excess abdominal gas. And we all know as the day goes on and we see our patients for abdominal studies, those patients seem to get gassier and gassier. We also want to make sure that we uh, have the patient and they're aware of the fact that during this examination they're going to need to hold their breath. Um, very important because these organs can move upwards to a centimeter or two from the position that you see them in as the patient is inhaling and exhaling. So having the patients take a deep breath in like these fine looking long, young ladies and holding that uh, breath or exhaling and holding it is really going to put the renal artery or the other vessels that you're looking at in a favorable position for you to take your Doppler flow and to uh, take favorable B mode and color and duplex imaging pictures. Really, really important when you're in the abdomen to be aware of the anatomy and certainly more than just the renal anatomy, but we'll start with that since that's our target vessel. Uh, the renal arteries are located about two centimeters below the xiphoid process, that distal portion of the sternum. Um, if I place my transducer right below the xiphoid process, I'm in pretty good shape um, to see the celiac, the SMA, and the renal arteries. But certainly, one of the landmarks I want to use when I'm in that transverse approach is the left uh, renal vein, which is going to come across the aorta 
uh, on its way uh, back to the IVC. Uh, and that landmark really serves as a good position for me to be in to identify both the right and the left renal arteries. Um, these arteries will arise from the lateral or posterior uh, lateral walls of the abdominal aorta. Um, the left will most of the time rise slightly above the uh, right. Um, we will definitely see these branching, uh, the branching effect of this renal artery as it moves towards the kidney. And 20 to 30 percent of the patients will have an accessory renal artery, which we'll talk about a little bit and some of the problems and solutions that we will come across uh, when we are doing these renal uh, duplex examinations when the patient has more than one renal artery. Uh, this is Dr. Netter's version of the anatomy. It's very well drawn, um, uh, and everybody probably uses this as a good starting point to get a feel for what we should be looking at. We can see the aorta coming through the diaphragm here, and the first major branch being the celiac, and the second one being the SMA. And then we can see the renal arteries in that location I just talked about, and there, in fact, is that left renal vein as it moves across uh, anterior to the aorta on its way back to the IVC. But the reality of it is, is that we're dealing with very tortuous vessels, and you'll note that when you're doing this examination. And these vessels will meander their way to the kidney, and uh, the veins will meander away from the organs back to the IVC, and it's really very unusual to see them on a single plane. So we have to take that in consideration when we are doing this examination, noting that we probably will have to use multiple positionings um, of the patient and of our transducer when we're trying to assess these arteries. As the arteries move to the kidney themselves, we start calling them a little bit different. You'll note that the renal artery is not well collateralized, so um, besides the um, accessory renal arteries or the supernumerary renal arteries that you may come across, that renal artery will leave the origin of the aorta on its way to the kidney, and when it gets to the kidney, it will divide itself as it moves into the hilum and then into the parenchyma, and we start to break up those specific arteries into certain segments. The first artery is the segmental, and then the inner lobar as it moves out towards the periphery, and the arcuates, which usually come across at a 90-degree angle, so sometimes the color filling is not as great as the inner lobar, which is the mo in the most distant portion of the tissue near the capsule region, those inner lobar arteries will be identified. Really need to have nice color settings to be able to get a picture like this, and we'll talk about how to make um, the uh, color settings and the patient positioning uh, very um, appropriate for you to obtain an image that will give you uh, very clear uh, demarcations of where these arteries are within this kidney parameter. We do have to know about variants, and you can see with these percentages here that they're a little bit uh, uh, seen more often than not. The precaval right renal artery, usually we would see this renal artery moving underneath the IVC on its way to the um, right kidney, uh, but most, some of the times, between 1 and 5 percent of the time, we may see this right renal artery going above the IVC, and it may make it a little bit more difficult or put more of a challenge on you to uh, be able to look for it in a different location. Like we said before, the multiple renal arteries are the majority of the anomalies that we may see uh, within this uh, system. Early bifurcations, 10 to 15 percent, this comes into play if we're looking at non-atherosclerotic disease uh, processes such as fibromuscular dysplasia, which usually take place between the mid and distal portion of the renal arteries. A left uh, renal vein uh, that lies retroaortic um, as opposed to uh, above the aorta or a circumaortic um, left renal vein on both and located uh, in both the upper uh, port, the anterior and posterior to the IVC, which is in a whopping 9 percent and probably it happens and we see it but we don't actually document it uh, because we're not looking for it because there's a lot of things going on in that specific area. And, Frankly, sometimes you're pushing down pretty hard to be able to um, maintain access to the renal arteries, and you may be actually including this left renal vein in the process or making it so small that you don't really see it. Um, okay, and in multiple renal veins also, 25% are more often found on the right side, which is a nice little thing to remember when you're scanning. So indications for this renal duplex examination, when the patient comes into your lab, they're probably going to have some type of uncontrolled hypertension. That is the most likely indication that you will come across. You also know patients that have renal failure that uh, have been requested to have this exam 
the ubiquitous abdominal flank buoy, uh, which really entitles you to scan every artery in the abdomen, but certainly if this patient has uncontrolled hypertension coupled with the flank buoy, the renal arteries are highly suspect that that may in fact be causing that. Following radiological or surg surgical interventions, obviously as we follow up the lower extremity, um, uh, arterial bypass grafts and carotid endarterectomies, we would want to do the same for renal arteries and any known renal artery stenosis that may not have been treated uh, surgically, maybe still doing a medicinal uh, type of treatment for the hypertension, but they want to follow it, uh, you will um, note that uh, these patients will be coming back into the lab. And then we have patients that uh, have elevated creatinine or BUN. Uh, most of the time we see this as an indication when we're looking at um, uh, kidney transplants. And I wanna, another indication it seems like when patients come into your laboratory is uh, um, you tend to have a larger patient come in, not unlike some uh, patient that we may see here. Maybe you would see this patient with a, um, uh, maybe for a liver duplex examination also, but um, certainly this patient wouldn't come in for a mesenteric duplex examination for gut ischemia, but certainly they may have hypertension due to their excess weight and uh, this exam would be very challenging and frankly probably would not be able to see anything from midline approach and we'd have to do everything laterally on these large, larger po uh, patients. And we will talk about that. So the prevalence of hypertension, you know, we get about 60 million patients within the United States that have some form of hypertension um, then hopefully you're being treated for it if necessary, uh, if their doctor thinks it's appropriate. Within that general population, less than 1% of them will have it, uh, that hypertension, if you would, um, based on having renal vascular hypertension or the cause of the hypertension being from a stenosis within the renal artery or proximal to the renal artery that's causing uh, low blood flow to the kidneys. If the uh, clinical um, or the uh, clinical acumen of the referring physician is pretty high, they can select out a population within these, this group of uh, individuals that will yield 17% of uh, those patients having renal vascular hypertension. And that's kind of the group that we want to have selected out before they come to our lab. That clinical selection that these uh, physicians will be using is basically that severe hypertension that I showed as an indication on all these causes with diastolic flows consistently above 115 millimeters of mercury, uh, malignant hypertension, hypertensive encephalopathy, encephalopathy um, patients with uncontrolled hypertension, um, and these are the patients that really are ones that um, really uh, make me think that there may be something going on. The systolic pressures of above 165 and very high end diastolic pressures of above 95 um, that are on three or more antihypertensive medications and the hypertension is not being resolved. Also, we look for patients that have accelerated hypertension, which is an increase in diastolic flow of 15% within the last six months. And then onset of hypertension between the uh, lower ends before they get to 25 or greater than 45. Uh, abdominal flank buoy, like we also mentioned, will buy you a pretty extensive examination, but if that is coupled with hypertension, that's a pretty good indication to have this duplex examination caused. Now, why do we do uh, this type of exam? I mean, a lot of people just do it because they were told to do it. Well, the kidney itself really helps control your blood pressure. Um, and a lot of, some people don't know that. Um, the, the kidney acts as a buffer zone um, in a flight or flight response. If, for instance, you are losing a lot of blood, the kidney reacts to that loss of blood by re releasing renin uh, at the level of the juxtaglomerular apparatus. And that renin, as it's into the system, will convert, angi will convert angiotensin 1, and then angiotensin 1 converts to angiotensin 2. And that uh, leads to a whole bunch of cascading things of releasing aldosterone um, by um, incorporating uh, more salt into the system so that your blood pressure increases. The uh, nervous system will then shut down or clamp up some of your arterioles in your peripheral so the system is conserving that pressure to the, uh, the central portion of your body and your brain. And all these things take place because the kidney, which has no brain cells, right, is trying to compensate for this lack of pressure. And of course it can be fooled, right? If you have a stenosis in front of that 
uh, kidney in front of that gestural marrow apparatus, um, it will release the renin regardless of what is causing that drop in pressure. So if we can find that drop in pressure to be a stenosis within the renal arteries, and that can be um, fixed surgically, um, this patient uh, should, in fact, if it is renal vascular hypertension, have a drop in their blood pressure and possibly be able to come off their medicine. So this is a fantastic examination to do and a wonderful thing if we actually find renal artery stenosis and even more wonderful if that was the cause of their hypertension they can come off of their medicines. The pathophysiology that we will find within the renal arteries and the aorta that will cause this type of uh, problem within the system usually is atherosclerotic disease and we're all very familiar with that being vascular technologist and that mostly is located at the orificial or proximal segments of this renal artery. A lot of times you'll note that this disease is located within the aorta and probably may start there and then encroach and in and go into the origin orifice of the renal artery and extend towards the kidney themselves. But most of the time, that proximal portion of the renal artery will be where you find the highest velocities. And as I mentioned before, as you move mid to distally, you may not find that much atherosclerotic disease, but if you do see an increase in flow, I would be very um, interested in the fact that there may be fibromuscular dysplasia. And also note that fibromuscular dysplasia, if it's in the renal arteries, it may also occur in the mid to distal portions of the internal carotid artery. So you may want to call up the referring physician and note that you saw this increase in velocity in the mid to distal portions of this patient and ask if they would like or should they, um, if they would like you to uh, look at the internal carotid arteries to see if they have any increase in velocity there. And of course, we have some trauma that may cause intimal dissection or some disease states such as Marfan's um, and you need to be aware that that could cause a decrease in blood flow to the kidneys. A lot of times this is not, the dissection is not located within the renal artery itself but within the aorta and maybe is uh, in the false or true lumen and that blood flow is then therefore being um, uh, hampered getting to the kidney and that whole renin process starts and you have an increase in blood pressure due to that. And certainly aneurysmal disease may cause a lack of uh, blood flow to the kidney and that drop in pressure which would also trigger it. Aneurysmal disease will also uh, need to be noted within the uh, aorta in this case because you have aneurysmal disease obviously in any artery but within the aorta because some of our parameters that we use to define the disease um, from a velocity standpoint we cannot use if we're using if we see an aneurysm within the um, aorta itself okay so here's a little quote that I, I thought I came up with, but frankly, maybe I heard it from somebody else. But there is always more than one way to do something, and someone will always have an opinion on which method is best. And just like anything else that we've been scanning, people have been looking at different ways to do uh, or to define disease, and the kidney is no different. And here's a little analogy. Certainly, there's a right way to change and see if a baby's diaper needs to be changed. You can see this is a method that I would prefer, but some other people um, prefer the uh, direct method um, for changing a diaper. Um, this is probably something I would try once and note that uh, it wasn't a good approach. Now, ironically, I do prefer a direct method um, to look at the renal arteries um, specifically, and uh, I use the indirect method or just looking at the parenchyma signal and deriving some certain feeling that there may or may not be something going on proximal to it based on the waveform and certain parameters that I'll set up um, when I'm doing the kidney only if I can't use the direct approach. So we'll talk about both of these um, during this examination and um, you can pick which one works for you and I hope you base that on um, your internal protocols and also the QA data that you get back uh, from doing your studies and looking at the gold standard that you use within your hospital or your lab. Patient positioning, um, I think I mentioned this a little bit before, but is very, very important. Um, also, um, something that you need to talk to the patient about while you're taking an HMP and you're letting them know about holding their breath and all the other things that are going to be happening during th this examination. Mainly, you'll have the patient um, start in a um, uh, supine position, and here are two of my favorite sonographers that I had the pleasure of working with. Um, at Hershey Medical Center and uh, have uh, Lori laying down here in a supine position while Stephanie is scanning 
her. Um, you can see I have Lori's hands up in the air and behind her head. Now this position is very hard to hold for long periods of time. So I don't often use this, but it really can raise that rib cage up and allow you access to that proximal portion uh, of the abdomen right below that xiphoid process. Um, but like I said, this may be an exam that you're going to be um, performing for upwards of an hour and uh, that patient's not going to be able to hold that position for long. So if I'm having trouble getting access below that xiphoid process to look at those arteries in the midline approach, I'll have this patient go in this position. But certainly I want the patient in a reverse Trendelenburg position, slight reverse Trendelenburg position, because I want those organs to drop down a little bit, giving me better access to those proximal renal arteries in the proximal aorta. Uh, when I go towards the kidney and I look at the parenchyma, often I'll have to put the patient in a lateral decubus position. And you can see that uh, Stephanie has uh, um, Lori in this position. Her leg here is straight, which I really prefer. A lot of people, when they're put in a lateral decubus position, will bend their leg into what we call like a fetal position. Um, I allow this bottom leg to be in that fetal position, but I want that top leg to kind of be straight because that'll bring that hip bone down a little bit. And by raising this hand up here, you will raise up that uh, rib cage and it'll give you a nice little access to this flank approach that will give you um, great imaging of that kidney, especially when you're doing the uh, indirect approach, which we talked about before, uh, which all that information is gained from signals within the kidney itself. So the direct evaluation, this is the method that I prefer and the method that I kind of look for to define whether or not there's renal artery stenosis. Um, we want to go through a certain protocol and that protocol includes taking velocities at the proximal aorta because you'll use that as the denominator within the renal aortic ratio calculations that will define the disease. Um, I also like to evaluate the celiac and superior mesenteric artery mainly for the waveform morphology. It kind of gives me another marker to know where I am within the body and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, Doppler spectral interrogation must take place along the entire length of the renal artery if you're going to call this a direct evaluation. Um, that um, interrogation then uh, therefore may have to take place um, be in the supine position and the lateral decubus position because of that tortuosity tortuosity that I mentioned before. And then obviously I want to go to the end organ and obtain a length because we know if blood flow has been restricted to a uh, organ, that organ will become, uh, will atrophy and become smaller. So I'm looking for a certain length to make me feel like that uh, this, this organ is getting enough of blood. And if I see it being way off from what I expect, then I am looking probably for some type of occlusion or critical stenosis that's been at chronic stages and um, should be found before I let that patient go. So the mesenteric arterial anatomy. Well, I'm going to look at the celiac artery and the superior mesenteric and inferior, and you may be thinking, what is this guy talking about? Why? I just mentioned I really want to see the waveform morphology, so I really don't care about the left gastric in this situation, nor do I care about the inferior mesenteric. But I really care about that splenic artery and that superior mesenteric artery. And if I see some problems with the celiac artery, I want to kind of take a peek at that splenic and the hepatic because it's going to, it should match up with the waveform morphology that I'm seeing in the celiac artery unless there's a problem there. Um, the reason I want to do this is because I feel that uh, that waveform morphology is another marker, like I said, to help me define where the renal, uh, where the renal arteries are because quite often I do not have a great window and I don't have a great look at this wonderful uh, picture that Dr. Netter has right here where I have the celiac and the SMA and the renal arteries right in front of me and everything looks hunky-dory. Um, that waveform um, also, uh, or that view also allows me to take my Doppler signal right where I want to every time for that equation, that renal aortic artery equation that I was mentioning before, uh, where that proximal aorta will serve as the denominator within that equation. And you can see that I have nice uh, parallel uh, sample volume with the uh, Doppler cursor parallel to the vessel wall right at the level of the celiac. And that's another reason I like to interrogate that to say that I know exactly where I was in that vessel. But the uniqueness of the waveform is really what I'm going for, like I've mentioned. The celiac artery is going to feed the splenic, uh, the splenic, the celiac artery is going to feed the splenic artery and the hepatic artery, which will go to the uh, hepatic artery going to the liver and the splenic artery going to the spleen, which are very high-end, uh, high 
and organs that are always demanding blood flow, right? So very high diastolic flow is needed to, flow, to feed these organs. And I use the fact that this waveform is going to be a little bit different than the spleen. Um, these bo all these waveforms, the hepatic artery also will have this type of waveform pattern, and the splenic artery will also have this type of waveform pattern. But the SMA should have a much more resistant wave pattern, waveform pattern because remember I asked the patient to come in NPO. And coming in NPO means that that SMA really doesn't have to do much work, right? It doesn't have any food in the system that it has to go down and uh, supply blood for. So it, 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 it usually in a normal state will be a very resistant pattern, especially when compared to the celiac. So I have a situation set up here where the celiac artery is low resistant, the, splenic, the SMA, I'm sorry, is high resistant, and then I'm going to go into the renal arteries, which would also be a high resistant signal. However, sometimes you'll note that the renal artery will look like the SMA, and you can look how this signal looks very resistant because the kidney itself is not functioning properly. Not from the standpoint of renal artery stenosis, but uh, from the standpoint of the uh, renal um, system itself. That kidney itself has medical renal disease, and it is not accepting blood the way we would like to at the end organ uh, level, and we have a very resistant pattern instead of the very open pattern that we like to see with high diastolic flow. So that's something to note. There is the ratio that we've talked about with the renal, renal aortic ratio eking equaling the peak renal artery velocity over the proximal aortic velocity, which we took at the level of the celiac artery. Certainly, you don't have to take it at that level, but you should take it at a level above the renal artery. All right? When we start this examination and we've taken the aortic signal, we want to move down into um, the kidney itself by via the renal artery. So we'll start at the aorta from the midline approach and walk ourselves into the proximal portion of these renal arteries. As we obtain all these signals, we want to put the highest peak systolic velocity, either whether it is in the proximate or distal portion of the renal artery, and the numerator of the equation with that denominator beating that aortic signal that you took proximal to this level. And if it's below 3.5, we consider this to be a normal renal artery in the sense that we don't think there's significant disease that's causing hypertension. Um, if we can't use that, we also look for a mark of 180 centimeters per second. And if I say I can't use that, what I mean is if the ratio cannot be used in some situations that we're going to talk about, we can't use this ratio. I'll look for a velocity of 100 centimeters per second. Um, quite often you'll find that other people will move these velocities around. Some people prefer higher velocities. Some people prefer lower velocities when they're looking purely at velocities. But for any of these cases, um, I want to be at a lower velocity than 180 and certainly certainly a lower renal aortic ratio than 3.5 if I'm going to say this is normal. That coupled with no increases in velocity throughout the, any other portion of the renal artery, no evidence of turbulent flow, and a low resistance spectral pattern kind of tells me that the kidney is probably adequately being supplied with blood. Like I said before, that kidney length is very important. It kind of gives me a marker that the things that I'm seeing, if I think they are right, um, should be uh, then proven by having a pretty nice sized kidney. And a normal sized kidney is between 9 and 12 centimeters. Anything less than 9, I start getting a little concerned that there may be some type of stenosis or occlusion proximal. Um, certainly, I want to compare the kidney size to um, the, other, the other side of the body. So the ipsilateral compared to the contralateral kidney is also going to be a marker for me. I never rely on just one thing, and I don't think anybody should when they're doing a duplex ultrasound. Always having more than one thing as a marker really boosts your confidence, whether there's disease or there's not disease. Certainly, when I'm looking at the kidney, I want to turn on my color, and that can be a good marker also, even before I take my... Uh, renal artery signal, I know that this vessel is perfusing pretty well. I don't know if there's medical renal disease really um, based on this image right here, but I can tell you that this kidney is getting a lot of blood flow to it. I have a very nice uh, result when I put my color box on. I do want to make sure that my, uh, my uh, PRF is set appropriately and then my gain is set appropriately to obtain it windows like this uh, and to obtain an image like this. I also want to make sure those same parameters are set appropriately if I am in fact looking for uh, a, looking at a kidney that I think does not have much blood flow to it such as this one that we see right here. We can also use some of the other uh, modalities within the machine itself, such as pa color power angio or, or power angio, um, which will give us some, uh, perhaps some better sensitivity within the abdomen, but it's very flash uh, sensitive too, so you really have to have the patient hold their breath while, they're doing, uh, while you're doing any type of power angio. 
When we're at the kidney, we also want to pay attention to any other anomalies that are outside of the ar arterial system also that we can relay back to the interpreting physician. And some of those will be the ones that I'll show you here. A horseshoe kidney, very, very difficult exam. Many times a horseshoe kidney will have multiple renal arteries coming off of it. Very challenging for you. Very cool thing to see though. And uh, if you have students, it's certainly something that you want to bring that student into the room and show them. You don't see it that often, but when you do see it, um, it is a challenging exam and, and something that you probably will, e even if you're an experienced sonographer, may want to bring in another technologist to help out with and make sure that you didn't miss anything. Kidney stones obviously could be causing some type of uh, abdominal pain in these patients um, and are noted but usually by these shadows that we see here. Hydronephrosis, most often we see this um, from a standpoint of vascular lab when we're looking at kidney transplants. Polycystic disease is often found uh, when you're doing this examination and must be noted. Uh, these signals are very resistant, obviously, um, when they get into the, the uh, when you get into the parenchymal and even to the renal artery, because remember, there's not much collateralization here. So these resistant signals are caused by probably some compression uh, with all these cysts around. And then, of course, uh, unfortunately, if we see some type of mass in the lo in the re region of the kidney, we want to pass that information on to the interpreting physician and the requesting physician. Um, for further testing. As we move into uh, a higher disease state, there's another category that's less than 60 percent, but we think that uh, may be approaching 60 percent and that uh, we need to note. And we, we see that when the RER is still less than 3.5, uh, but the p systolic velocity is above 180, but we do not see that post anotic signal. You really want to pay attention to your angle correction here. You want to make sure that you have multiple um, locations that you have um, looked at and locations I mean throughout the entire length and from a midline approach and from a lateral decubus approach and that lateral decubus approach I prefer I think that that velocity really gives me a better feel of whether or not there's disease there because I'm coming at probably a less than 30 degree angle and a lot of times right around a zero degree angle and uh, that uh, comfort zone of knowing I'm getting the strongest Doppler shift back and if that velocity is is very high and sets itself into the uh, RER above 3.5 or close to 3.5 and a higher velocity, I really think that there is some type of disease state. And coupled with the same type of velocities or, or high velocities from the midline state, I, I am very, very confident that we are in some type of, uh, we have some type of problem within the renal artery. For the patients with uh, severe disease, we really have some high velocities here. It's not uncommon um, to have breweries associated with these high velocities. Um, not also not uncommon for your system to go into a high PRF setting because of the depth of these vessels. Um, greater than 60% stenosis in this case is denoted by an RAR now of above 3.5. And to get that 3.5 RAR, you certainly are going to be above 180 centimeters per second in most cases, if not all. And you will have that post turbulence and a low or a high resistance spectral pattern depending on what is also going on within the kidney itself. So here is a angiogram that shows that renal artery stenosis on the left side and you can see that very well and this usually is a confirmatory test um, uh, for the patient and one that you'll be using as a gold standard that with MRI and some, some, some CTs um, may be taking place in your lab but you'll be using this for your gold standard to compare to uh, the stenosis that you have recorded during a duplex examination. You can see a lot of flash here and I'll have a lot of pretty pretty um, pictures here but uh, the reality of it is is that it gets pretty tough um, to uh, optimize your system perfectly when you're in the abdomen you may see some images that um, aren't pretty but the the proof in the pudding is really with this Doppler spectral data. And here you can see a, a stenosis um, that is playing right here um, of, of something I found in the right renal artery. And I, it's from a midline approach because you can see that straight up and down angle. But my angle of incination is parallel to the walls here with my um, line right here, my um, uh, angle uh, right here very nicely shown at 60 degrees. Now you don't have to maintain a 60 degree angle here. Anything less than 60 degrees is much appropriate. In fact, like I just mentioned before, anything close to zero is really, really appropriate. What you do have to maintain is if you're going to see this patient back again um, and you're trying to compare velocities, please look back at the old um, studies and make sure that your uh, angle is uh, matching up to the angle that you used before. 
Here is uh, some uh, waveforms that you need to be able to recognize. There's that tight stenosis. Here's in the aftermath. And uh, you need to know that this turbulent signal happens right after this. If you go too far out, you may see some normalization of this and miss this post-stenotic surface. Uh, turbulence. and really, really high stenotic lesions, you will have this TARDIS parvus waveform, which is a pure sign, and really, you can almost bet the bank on it, but you probably never do that in medicine because you never know, but seeing something like this really is a good indicator that there is a severe stenosis in front of it. The interpretation, interpretation criteria for the indirect study um, really has to do with acceleration time and acceleration, and that really is telling you, I'm trying to find out how fast and, uh, and, and uh, how, uh, how long it takes for a signal to reach end diastole to peak systole. And we can see that acceleration times greater than 0.07 seconds is a, is, is a problem and something that we think may be causing be caused by a more proximal stenosis and acceleration time of less than three meter, m meters per second is also something that we think may cause it. Some people also use early systolic peaks, and this, this is a little notch that we see right here within the kidney. To obtain this waveform, you really need to have some pretty good skill levels within that parenchyma signal, and the artery that we're going to be really trying to interrogate is that uh, segmental artery, that larger artery that we see that comes right through the hilum and is in that um, middle portion of the uh, kidney itself. And you can see some very good images right here denoting um, where our location of our calipers need to be for the acceleration uh, time and acceleration, as well as that early systolic peak. Over here you can see they do not have that type of waveform, more of a tardis parvus type of waveform, and we do not see that early systolic peak. This is something that will take you a long time to master, and you really have to have uh, a pretty firm control of your uh, ultrasound system. You can see that my waveform um, timeline is a little bit different. I've decreased it to two right here. Between two and three is really where you should have it to really spread out that waveform. And to obtaining these waveforms in the proximal, mid, and upper poles, uh, or the upper, mid, and lower poles, I'm sorry, I'm so used to saying proximal, mid, and distal, um, are very essential to make sure that you're not missing uh, any stenosis that may be an accessory renal artery also. Renal artery can, uh, occlusions can be very, very difficult also to see because you're looking for an artery that's not patent anymore, uh, you know, and it's like finding a needle in a haystack in a lot of these cases. The real indicator is probably that kidney itself, which has shrunken in size um, uh, in this situation where it's been a chronic problem. And uh, in fact, that is a good marker for you to realize that probably there is no uh, renal artery. And also when you do find that renal artery, you may have these staccato type signals certainly within the parenchyma or within that renal artery itself uh, before that occlusion. The renal parenchymal system also can give you some information. I mentioned this before about medical renal disease, and there's several ways to look at this. Some people use an RAR, I mean not RAR, and resistive indice of 0.75 or greater. Um, other people have manipulated that equation and kind of put the end diastolic above or below the thing. We used uh, a uh, four as a marker for that, so our peak systolic um, was, uh, and our end diastolic values were used to give us a whole number, and anything greater than four we thought was uh, medical renal disease. And you can really eyeball this also. You really don't need to quantify it. You can note that this is pretty normal diastolic flow, whereas this is not, and you can say that the patient has uh, medical renal disease. That is always coupled with the uh, blood work that, that you'll see has high, uh, that the patient will have high creatinine levels. So those two have to come together for this to make sense. So always use the patient history also as a marker of medical renal disease. Quickly, some things to remember. Um, you don't want to use that renal artery ratio uh, when there's an aneurysm. You want to have velocities that you're obtaining in that proximal aorta segment that are between 50 and 100 centimeters. Anything above or below that, you don't want to use the renal artery ratio. Also, young patients, the data that was collected that we're using is really not based on a young patient population. In fact, these patients are oftentimes very old that we see, and therefore, all the data that we collected were on these older patients. Um, and younger patients are not part of that cohort, so the criteria does not hold for them. And then renal artery stents, a lot of people have done a lot of work, and there's some good publications out there, but I don't think anybody has really landed on a certain um, criteria to use when you're dealing with renal artery stents yet. Remember those 
uh, multiple renal arteries, 20 to 30 percent of the population. In fact, you'll probably see the one that has the stenosis and miss the one that doesn't, so it works out well for us. But pay attention to them. It's nice to identify both of them. Um, you labeling them correctly is also nice too, but these patients are probably on their way to an angiogram or some other testing modality that can kind of uh, let you know whether it was in the inferior portion or the superior portion uh, when you're looking at it. FMD, remember that this is the second most common cause of renal vascular hypertension. It most commonly uh, will affect the mid to distal segments of the renal artery, but like I said before, don't count on it not affecting the proximal portion, um, but I would most likely and have most likely seen it in that mid to distal portion. It's commonly found in young women, so if you see a young woman approach uh, your lab for this type of study, be suspicious that it's probably FMD, especially if you're looking at the aorta and that mesenteric and celiac artery levels and you see no disease whatsoever. It can occur bilaterally, so make sure that you look at both sides, uh, which is commonly uh, done when you do a renal duplex examination. And then remember, like I said before, the internal carotid artery distally is also affected. And here's a nice angiogram of this fibromuscular dysplasia. You can see that that proximal portion is perfect, uh, but the distal portion of this artery does uh, have this, what they call a string of pearls. Um, right here, and you can see there are a string of beads. Um, you can see that same effect very nicely done uh, by, uh, I think I got this from uh, Cindy Owen and Mike Ledgewig, um, one of my friends that, uh, that uh, are also educators, and you can see that that correlates very, very well. Kind of historically, but we need to know about, there are renal artery bypass grafts out there, and sometimes they're still being placed, but most of the time we'll see stents. There are aorenal bypass grafts, splenorenal, hepatorenal, and iliorenal. I always use the same renal aortic, renal aortic ratio, but they are located in different locations. Here is what we'll see most of the time now, and that are these stents, and you can visualize them pretty well because they, they, uh, they are bright metal objects that uh, will be shown, and that stent um, uh, will follow itself and track itself in the same anatomical location, so it's a little bit easier than bypass grafts, right, because it's within the same renal artery itself. Uh, what I like to do is kind of, uh, because it's an orificial thing and a lot of times the stent extends into the aorta, I like to start in the aorta and walk myself into the renal artery if, if that is possible based on the image that I'm allowed to obtain based on the patient's body habitus. So you can see me doing that right here as I move from the aorta into the renal artery and obtain that velocity. So some take homes, the direct method. you know. The combination probably works the best, but if you use a direct method alone, it may be inaccurate if stenosis is undetected uh, in the accessory renal artery if that is missed, but I think that in most cases you will find that accessory renal artery because of that high color brewery if it does in fact have the disease and the other artery is, is the one that's widely patent. Um, inability to visualize the entire length of the renal artery, uh, which is not that uncommon because of obesity, bowel gas, patient unable to hold their breath, a lot of other factors. So uh, if you can't see the entire length and you're uncomfortable that you miss some sections, especially if they're the proximal sections, you certainly don't want to put that you think this exam is completely normal. You can improve your accuracy by having angles of less than 60 degrees, and I've already mentioned that, so you do not need to obtain 60 degrees, and please do not think that that is part of uh, the renal duplex examination or any abdominal examination having to maintain a 60 degree angle. Do not want to go above it, but you certainly can go below it. In fact, the lower the angles that you get, the better it's going to look. Demonstration of post stenotic turbulent is a must if you are going to say that this, in fact, is a flow-reducing stenosis maintain all those uh, waveforms so you can show them to the interpreting physician to prove that you in fact were able to see the proximal mid and distal segments and then always a uh, patient always position your patient appropriately when you are doing this examination because it can really help you open up different windows. That indirect method that we mentioned before, inaccurate when the RAR is greater than 0.75, so we know there's probably some type of medical renal disease going on, and if they have triple A's, just like the um, renal artery, RAR is inaccurate if we have a triple A in that proximal midsection of the renals. Actually will improve if angles are used that are less than 30 degrees. And the way you do that is you bring that kidney as close to the surface as you can um, and you use the appropriate transducer. Sometimes since you're trying to get that parenchyma tissue as close to the surface, you can in some patients, especially the thinner ones, you'll note, you'll note that um, that is really, really close to the surface and you can go drop down to a linear transducer and it may help you get uh, better angles of intonation. Um, sweep speed should be changed to two to three seconds to really elongate that signal, lower PRF. Uh, larger sample volume should be used in, and, uh, when you're looking at anything in the kidney parenchyma. And waveforms should be obtained in the upper, mid, and lower poles. 
And with that, I'd like to thank you and hope you um, have learned something from this lecture and you um, continue to scan renal arteries. And if you haven't tried them, you now attempt to do that after hearing this.